Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. It's our pleasure here at the MEI to be hosting uh, Hamoun Khelgad Dost today. Right. Uh, he is a final year PhD candidate here at the NUS at the Department of Political Science. His PhD research on gender dynamics within jihadi organizations mm. focuses on the relationship between the jihadi organization's view on state building and the roles women are assigned to within these organizations. Some of his academic work has already appeared in the Journal of Counterterrorist Trends and Analysis, uh, the Fletcher Forum of World Affairs, the Central European Journal of International and Security Studies, and several other uh, outlets. Um, and he has recently returned from a very hairy trip to all kinds yeah. of exotic places, including Absolutely. technically the Islamic State. Am I correct there? Uh, yes. It yeah. Was, OK. Was, so uh, some dodgy visa stamps <laughs> yeah, yeah, in was, your passport. It was, it was quite a story. Over to you, Hamad. All right. Thank you so much for that, Fener. And thank you so much for everyone um, for taking your time coming here. Really appreciate that. Um, if you don't mind, because I'm going to use the slides, I just stand here and uh, start the presentation from here. Uh, as Fener was talking about, the presentation is mostly on the gender dynamics in jihadi organizations, and that is making the backbone of my PhD research here at NUS. To give you an overview on what I am going to talk about, well, as many of you might be aware, the, um, there are quite a number of restrictions on the social involvement of Muslim women when it comes to different aspects of life in countries, especially in the Middle East and North Africa. And the reasons for these restrictions, well, many, many people would be actually disagree with that, or it's a debatable thing, is coming from that uh, conservative interpretations of the Islamic jurisprudence together and matched with traditions and cultural values that many of these countries are actually holding. And the same kind of uh, um, conservative in interpretation of the Islamic jurisprudence and the cultural and traditional norms and values not only restricts those social movements, but also restricts women's affiliation or incorporation into jihadi organizations or jihadi activities at the same time as well. However, the empirical evidence uh, clearly demonstrates that there appears to be a clear increase in the number of women joining different jihadi organizations throughout the places that, that they uh, operate. And at the same time, this increase is not only in the number of these women, but also in the diversity of roles they play in jihadi organizations. It is also interesting to, to look at when we are cl looking closer to these empirical evidence. This empirical evidence also suggests that the incorporation, the increase, I mean, the, 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 the increase in the trend of women's incorporation into jihadi organizations is not proportionately distributed among all jihadi organizations, which means some jihadi organizations are more inclusive of women than the other ones when it comes to numbers and also in terms of their uh, the roles that women play in these jihadi organizations. With that, we will be coming up to a puzzle that we would be uh, trying to deal with that today. And that puzzle would be contrary to the negative perspective of the <clears throat> conservative Islamic jurisprudence and cultural traditions on women's engagement with jihadi organization. There is an increasing trend in uh, number and roles of women incorporated into jihadi organization, into these jihadi organizations. And as I said, this increase is not proportionately distributed. And with that, this research question is actually the backbone of my research, to search an answer, to seek for an answer for the question that I thought it would be interesting, which comes from the same puzzle. Why is women's incorporation into jihadi organization in both numbers and roles increasing despite the restrictions of the conservative Islamic jurisprudence and the cultural traditions on women's participation in jihadi activities. And this question is important to be answered because these jihadi organizations, all of them almost, are coming from a very, very conservative or believing in a very conservative ideology um, or interpretation of the Islamic jurisprudence. To answer these questions, 
I actually uh, embarked into a journey to collect data that I, was, I, I needed for, um, which I thought I, it would be necessary to, to, to collect to answer the question and the puzzle that we were first facing. And for that reason, I first started the first round of the journey between August uh, 2015 to December 2015, which covered countries, namely Afghanistan, Iraq, Turkey, and Lebanon. And in the second part of my data collection, I uh, traveled to southern part of Turkey, namely the cities Gaziantep, Kilis, and San Liurfa in the southern part along the borders of Syria, and also the northern part of Iraq in the uh, regions of Makmur, Bakarat, Kalak, and also Dabika uh, in the northern part of Iraq, which is bordering the um, Islamic State's territory in Iraq, and that was between May to July 2016. And I will be hoping to embark to the third round, the third round of the story uh, sometimes in this December. So to give you an idea of how things were working, um, if you look at here, for example, um, this gray part, uh, the, where, yeah, this uh, light gray part is the Turkish territory. Uh, this is the city of Gaziantep, which I started my trip, and then uh, around here is the city of San Liurpa, and down here is Kilis, the uh, border city of, uh, one of the border cities of, of um, Syria, and this whole chunk of Syria in, 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 uh, in the southern part. So many of the jihadi fighters who wants to pass to Syria use the city of Kilis through Gaziantep to enter Syria. Um, this dark gray part is where, in July 2016, ISIS were still holding um, its uh, territory. So I meet quite a number of people here in Kilis, Gaziantep, and San Yurfa, uh, refugees mostly, and uh, some of the Turkish police and Turkish authorities uh, to talk about the issue that uh, I'm going to talk about now. Um, this is my translator there. Um, um, she wa he was a Turkish guy who could speak Arabic, and he was the one translating the, my, uh, the whole entire interviews for me for about two weeks we were together. Uh, cost a lot, actually, but uh, <laughs> yeah, and um, then this is the exit of the city of Gaziantep towards the border in Kilis. If you see here, you can see that it says Kilis, and under that it is uh, said Hadep. Hadep is the pronunciation of the city Aleppo in, in Turkey. So that is the way that the whole journey has started to the borders of uh, Turkey and the Islamic State. And if you look at these papers in this page here, this picture here, um, this is at the outskirts of the city of Kilis. So literally right behind this hill, it is where the Islamic State starts. Um, they still have the open border and uh, not that much of surveillance is going on. So during the night, middle of the night is a time that the smugglers start to pass those uh, jihadi fighters or sometimes journalists into the uh, ISIS territory. Continuing that journey, um, it came to the northern part of Iraq in yellow here is the city of Erbil as the capital of the Kurdish authority. So I spent most of my time in this area of Bakarat at this borderline between uh, the city of uh, Bakarat in Makmur um, uh, area, the city of Bakarat here in this, along this border. It was the time that I uh, was uh, together with the Peshmerga, the Kurdish militia forces here um, at the border here. And also um, right at this junction here, we have uh, the, the refugee camp of Dabika, which holds, I mean, which uh, is home to about 4,000 Iraqi IDPs and Syrian refugees. So continuing that, uh, it's the front line there, right at the border with the Peshmerga forces. Um, and this is how the whole thing looked like. So this is exactly the place that I was standing. And this is the view that you have. You have some fences here, which is marking the border between um, the Iraqi Kurdish authority. And you have about a kilometer of a buffer zone. And here, um, I don't know if it's uh, showing it properly, uh, there is some shadows there, and these shadows are where the authorities, I mean, the, the ISIS territory is stuck. It's, it's a small village there, and that marks the beginning of the ISIS territory. 
And of course, uh, uh, it is in the camp of Dibata uh, there where I met quite a number of Syrian refugees, women, children, and men who have been quite helpful, very helpful actually, in collecting the data that I need for this PhD research. So talking about the journey, going back again to the main question of, the, of, of my research, to answer that question that why we have this increasing number of women in jihadi organizations in both numbers and also in, in, in terms of roles, and uh, why this whole distribution of women and joining of women is dis uh, disproportionate, I developed in this research a twofold typology of jihadi organization to answer the question that I mentioned right now. And in this typology, I am dividing jihadi organizations into two types of operation-based jihadi organizations and state-building jihadi organizations. And through this typology, I am going to, to argue that um, the question of my research can be answered. And that would show actually the dynamics of how women actually uh, um, um, distributed in these jihadi organizations, what type of jobs are they um, assigned to, and why the numbers are increasing in, in some and decreasing in some. To make it more tangible, if we look at the, the typology that I have here, if we start with the operation-based jihadi organizations, these organizations are those organizations that classically are considered as Islamist um, terrorist organizations, things that we have heard, uh, groups that we have heard a lot about them, like Al-Qaeda, Jumai Islami of Indonesia, the Haggani Network in, in Pakistan, Lashkar Jangways in Pakistan, and many others, like uh, what we have um, uh, Ansar Sunnah in Iraq, or other jihadi organizations that we have in Syria, and other parts of the world. On the other hand, when we are talking about, when, we are, when I'm talking about state building jihadi organizations, I'm talking about groups such as Islamic State or ISIS as we all know about. ISIS franchises, those who are affiliated with ISIS in countries like Libya or Yemen, and also Jafat, Jafat Fat or Sham, and another group of uh, Jaish al Fat, which both of them operate in Syria around the Idlib province. So these are the groups that I consider them as jihadi, uh, as a state building jihadi organizations, and those are the ones I count them as operation-based jihadi organizations. However, if you want to, to make a differentiate between these groups and see what makes these groups different and what is my basis of making this typology, in terms of ideology, operation-based operation jihadi organizations, operation-based jihadi organizations are uh, following the Salafi guerrilla, um, it's, a, it's a Salafi uh, guerrilla movement that for them violence is a vehicle to achieve, is one of the main vehicles to achieve the um, political or religious goals that they have. And they connect this whole idea of using violence to some divine or religious phenomenon such as uh, martyrdom or jihad itself. But what my research is mostly focused on when it comes to categorizing these, uh, categorizing jihadi organizations in these two groups is the internal structure of these groups. When it comes to jihadi organizations, they are having this clandestine uh, cellular network of structure. It means that the hierarchical structure of governance in these groups is broken and flattened into networks that each of these networks are consisted of few cells. And each of these few cells are, you know, few members are assigned to each of these few cells, and each member of the cell is in direct in, or in direct contact with the head of the cell and no one else. So therefore, majority of the people in the cell do not have any idea of a bigger picture of the network itself. And that is to counter the surveillance, because the secretive nature of these groups makes it impossible to, to for, for, or make it hard for the authorities to crack them down. And being secretive, being um, away from eyes, and having um, a, a structure with the least of distribution of information is something that they are focusing on. And for that reason, actually, 
I argue women play, can play a very, very important role for these groups. And why is it so? If you look at the countries that these operation-based GRU organizations are operating in, majority in the Middle East and North Africa, the security apparatus of these countries are very much male-dominated. And therefore, it is very difficult for them to um, implement what they have to do, like body search, house search, interrogations, and all this kind of stuff uh, over women. And that is because of those religious and cultural uh, restrictions that we have in those countries. Therefore, it makes it easier for women, for example, to pass checkpoints, to, to um, uh, host people or host jihadis in their safe houses, and et cetera, et cetera. And at the same time, um, I mean, this, this is very much uh, portrayed in the statistics that we have. For example, between 20, 2003 to 2011, if you look at the case of Iraq, uh, more than 75% of all the suicide bomb attacks were actually done by women, and they were using the same gap in the security apparatus of these countries to conduct those uh, attacks. So in that case, they were very successful. And at the same time, in countries in the Middle East majority, or North Africa, and, and North Africa and many places in the world, um, there is this pre-assumption that women are mostly gentle, um, soft, innocent, and therefore not really related to violent or not really violent in that sense. And that would actually uh, works also as a uh, plus point for these groups to, to use women. And therefore, women would be an asset to these groups. And that is what logically makes sense. However, if we look at it closer, we can see that with all these advantages that women provide for these groups, these groups are very much actually reluctant of using women. It's the irony that we have here, because women can really contribute to, to that clandestine structure of these groups, but at the same time, these groups are very much reluctant to do that. And that is exactly going back to the whole story of the value systems and also um, the restrictions of the cultural points from cultural point of view and also religious point of view. In, that, in those societies that we are talking about, a concept named maintaining women's sexual purity is a very, very important matter. The honor of the family, the honor of, of men is really tied to that uh, so-called maintenance of the women's sexual uh, purity. And for that reason, if you look at many countries in the Middle East, in many of them, women are being accompanied, for example, in public by someone, they call it mahram, M-A-H-R-A-M. Um, they are rather the husbands of these women or uh, the relatives with the prohibited degree of marriage. So the clandestine situation or the structure of these groups can create this situation in which um, putting women in this illicit relationship with non-mahram males. For it, because these are very covert, it's not an overt issue, it's a covert issue, it's secretive, it's behind doors, and it happens many times that you know, these women wantedly or unwantedly find themselves in a company of non-Mahram people. And that is something that you know, um, many of these groups traditionally, based on traditional um, values and also religious issues, do not want it to happen. And for that reason, Many of these groups have been very much reluctant in using women, although despite actually the, the technical uh, or tactical advantage that women can provide for these groups. Well, as we can, uh, as we know, and as we uh, uh, we can assume, the warfare style of these groups is mostly asymmetric. It's going back again to the structure that they have because they are clandestine, they are cellular, so uh, they. They operate mostly in ways like aircraft hijacking, bomb attacks, car bombing, hostage taking, and the most important one and the most popular one among them and the most uh, noted one in media is through the suicide bombing. If we can categorize what women are doing or what roles women are offered or assigned in these kind of organizations, we can see that the backbone of the reason for why these organizations assign them to these 
some of the, uh, the, the, the um, roles that I have listed here, is again going back to that secretive nature of these groups and the advantage that women provide in that terms. For example, um, I, in my uh, category, I divided the jobs that they have been assigned to women in these groups into two, combat tactical roles and non-combat tactical roles. This is following, actually, uh, what the dichotomy of where women's place is in society, private and, and, uh, and public. Therefore, those jobs that, or roles that are assigned to women for public are most of the combat roles, like uh, being a suicide bomber, and women are, good, I mean, are good choices for that because of what we have talked about, or cover a male fighter because they can raise less suspicion. And on the other hand, the non-combat roles are those who are, are those roles that women can do on their own in their, in their houses or, or without having that much of a problem of that kind of, that, that issue of marriage and things. For example, helping financing, um, opening bank accounts for jihadi organizations, do money laundry and all these kind of stuff, or um, work as messengers among uh, different cells of jihadi organizations or kinship support, like what we have in, in Jama Islamia in Indonesia, where um, the whole organization looks like a giant family because of uh, the intermarriages between the jihadis and the women to, to, make the, um, to, to, re to increase the resilience of, this, of the group, popular support and sympathy, which is also can be done among families without men being involved and also the logistic supports like providing food for, for jihadis, uh, I don't know, uh, doing the, their laundry things, um, these basic things, uh, which also can be done on their own as a part of their own job as, um, uh, in household. And also as recruiters and advocates, which do not need that much of connection with the uh, um, social life or social norms or, or a connection with people, or especially male, that they are not um, mahram with. So the whole composition of roles and the whole composition of um, contributions of women in these groups are very much related to that specific style of structure of these groups. And to first and foremost to counter surveillance by the, by the state or by the security apprentice, and also to avoid uh, illicit connections between different sexes. Moving apart that, we come from to the next uh, uh, category of jihadi organization, which I call them a state building jihadi organization. These groups are groups that they share in terms of ideology almost the same as, as uh, the as the operation based groups with this big um, difference that these organizations are actually um, clearly in search of establishing what they call it a state or a caliphate, which is mostly following the um, examples of the caliphates that we have at the earliest stages of Islam, um, mostly between the 8th century to the 13th century. And that is what they are actually after, that we can talk about that later on. But what is more important about these group is that these groups are holding identified territories. And for that matter, they are not really necessarily going to have this um, flattened structure of governance. On the other hand, they, like many other proto-states or the states, uh, they have a very overt uh, take on the structure of the governance, which would be having their own um, councils, leaders, uh, departments, and also um, offices. And this is actually been uh, portrayed in case of ISIS as the most famous one and other groups like Jaffa, Jaffa Fatul Sham or uh, Jaish al Fat that they are on the way to, uh, to uh, strengthen the establishment of their state. So they have different departments and in these different departments uh, people are assigned and they are overtly do the job. So there is no need to hide yourself, there is no need to be worried about being caught by authorities because you are the authority yourself. Therefore, the structure of them would be different from the other groups. And in terms of warfare, of course, uh, they use the combination of uh, conventional and asymmetric point. In countries like uh, in, in Iraq or in, uh, in um, Syria, when they were fighting the central government or the Assad regime, 
Um, it was a very conventional war in a way until the time that you know you are facing a stronger enemy, which would be the coalition or the Russians and things like that. That is the time that you mostly shift to non-conventional um, uh, kind of uh, warfare, like suicide bombing or other things. But before that, it was a very in a very conventional way, and the only thing that they didn't have is was mostly the the air force. Rather than that, you know, almost whatever the other groups had, or even the central government had, they had it too. So it was mostly in that symmetric. Uh, style of war. What, what actually makes the structure of these groups relevant to women is that the evidence shows that the state-building jihadi organization that I talk about, Jipat nusra I mean, Jipat nusra that's now changed to Jabhat Fat al-Sham, um, Jash al -Fat or, or ISIS, uh, provide a more favorable environment for the incorporation of women, both in terms of number and the roles that they have, and in compare with their jihadi, in their operation-based jihadi counterparts. And the reason for that is what makes the theoretical background, uh, the theoretical framework of my research. Um, a state building jihadi organizations seem to only be capable of establishing their states in rather failed or weak states. And that is the case that we have, for example, in Syria, in Iraq, some parts of Libya, and some parts of Yemen. So I'm trying to actually connect this issue to the issue of women. So we have to make that in mind in that sense. So for this reason, a state-building jihadi organization would be better understood through the theories of a state failure as, the follow of this, as they follow the same functional logic of uh, other non-jihadi organizations in utilizing the failed states in their favor. And what does that supposed to mean, utilizing a failed state or a weak state in your favor? This means that a state-building jihadi organization follow the same functional logic as I was saying, and they are trying to fill three gaps that mostly all the failed states or weak states have. And to fill these gaps, I'm arguing that women play a very, very important role. These gaps are, firstly, the security gap, secondly, service provision gap, and thirdly, legitimacy gap. Groups like ISIS, Jepat Fat uh, Sham, and also um, Jaish al Fat, as state building jihadi organizations, are trying to make themselves a functional alternative to the weak or the, uh, the, or the failed state that they are operating in, the, in those territories. And to do that, you have to be able of answering these three needs of the population and the territory that you have. You have to provide them with security, you have to provide the population with services that they need, and you have to have some degree of legitimacy there. And for that reason, women can, can actually fill these gaps without having the problem that the, most of the operation-based jihadi organization have, and that is the concept of mahram, or, or the concept of being in illicit I mean, in an illicit um, um, relationship or situation with different sex. In terms of security, women are incorporated in military forces and police forces in these uh, groups. And also, in terms of service provision, women are working as teachers and educators, as um, also in hospitals, doctors and nurses are are working, women doctors and nurses are working. Uh, there are women who are in charge of tax collections, uh, women who are working in housing and sheltering offices of uh, ISIS, and also other roles like matchmaking and other things that we hear. And at the same time, when it comes to legitimacy, we have this concept of hijra by women. Hijra means the migration to the Holy Land. Uh, in, in a very nutshell thing. So in that case, uh, we are seeing a number of women uh, from all around the world making informed decisions, which we can discuss about that later, to, to leave the societies that they live, Western societies or whatever society that has offered them the so-called emancipation of women and come to 
the state that we call it ISIS, or we call it, I mean, or other groups that are actually forcing, I mean, or, or enforcing their uh, territory, uh, enforcing their rules on that. And also, uh, through motherhood and, and, uh, and family, I mean, creating family, you know, there, are, there would be the, the mothers of the next generation of jihadis, and not only passive mothers, and not only passive uh, producer of the next generation, like many other people would discuss, but these are informed mothers. They are, these are mothers that they have been um, educated in the same system. These mothers having commitment to, to the system, to the ideology. So they are not only machine producer of kids. And that, is, that makes a big difference between them and, and um, many other jihadi operation based jihadi organization. And at the same time, we have this advocacy and recruitment that advocacy plays this very, very important role in attracting people to, to what you have, and therefore by that you can create more legitimacy for, for, your, uh, for your state. But the most important fact that we have to look at here is the mechanism of action by which these women are being incorporated in jihadi organizations like ISIS, like Jabhat Fatou Sham, or, or um, Jaish al -Fat. And that is through what I call gender segregated parallel institutions. And by this mechanism, they have come to conclusion to solve the issue that the operation-based jihadi organizations are facing when it comes into utilization of women. What does that supposed to mean? It means these gender segregated, you know, uh, these gender segregated, segregated parallel institutions are institutions which are run by women to address women's affairs only. So what it means? It means that you have an institution like a healthcare system. You have a hospital. A section of that hospital is designed, is, is assigned for women, for women, and whoever works there, from nurses to doctors, are women, and they are only able of visiting women. The same thing is the same parallel gender segregated, I mean, um, sections are distributed in all other state departments that we have, from the healthcare to education to tax collection to army to police to um, um, media hubs that they have and others. So they have created these things to minimize that sex, um, in, um, mixing between the sexes and therefore to avoid that theological or, or uh, ideological issue of dealing with non-mahrams in, in the society and also being an overt um, I mean, being an overt state you know, in a way that you, know, you don't need to hide yourself. It actually helped them to encourage more women to join. And for that reason, we can see that the number of women is flourishing in these groups and in compare with the operation-based groups. So there are more women who are working in the uh, um, roles and in departments and in gender segregated parallel institutions that we talk about here. And at the same time, it's very important also to realize that when we are talking about incorporation in this uh, research, uh, we are not, I'm talking about incorporation in, in, um, as an umbrella term for covering three concepts. It is uh, actually joining, being affiliated, and also being a member. That is very important. That is the way incorporation actually mean here. Because many people, when you look at the thing, when we are talking about ISIS women, we are mostly thinking about women who are on the front line or just blowing up themselves or fighting. No, by ISIS women or women of ISIS, we are talking about, in this research, I'm talking about a wide range of people. Those who are rather official members or those who are incorporated. It means that they are allowed by ISIS to work in the institutions. So it's just like, to give a better example, it's like uh, being in a state like, um, like Germany during a Nazi time. We had some women who are a part of the Nazi government, Nazi, I mean, they are a, a member of the party. At the same time, there are people or women who are working in institutions affiliated to the party, like the schools, hospitals, and this kind of stuff. Can they be considered as, as ISIS or as Nazi members or some? That's another story. But the fact is that they are on the payroll of the Nazi government. The same thing here we have that. They are on the payroll of, uh, payroll of ISIS and they are incorporated into different um, um, institutions uh, which are gender segregated. So by that, it doesn't mean that you know, they have to be fully committed to the ISIS idea, but the fact is that they are a part of the system. 
And, not being, and being a part of system means that ISIS has allowed them to be a part of system. It has been inclusive enough to keep them in the system. And that is coming in contrast, for example, with the case of Afghanistan, for example, where the Taliban was in charge. Taliban could have actually do the same thing as ISIS or the other groups in Syria are doing. But what they did was to be absolutely in excluded, uh, exclusive of women, ban women from almost every single social activity. And groups like ISIS are going the other way around. They are tolerant enough to accept a kind of people, uh, a, a certain number of women in different roles and, and in different positions, as we talked about, through this mechanism. Um, as I said, we, I don't want to go into detail of them and giving you examples, but if you had any questions about the examples, uh, I would be more than happy to make it. So we have, in the security, we have, as I said, military forces. ISIS have incorporated women into its military ranking. Now in the Mosul, I mean, when I was in, uh, in Kilis, I was talking to a few women there, and they were telling me that ISIS um, is going around in Mosul asking for women to uh, join its suicide squad, squad there. Um, um, and there were rumors like that. But nowadays, yes, uh, we can see actively these women are, you know, the, who are trained are being used in, in Mosul front against uh, the Iraqi forces and coalition forces. They are being used there. Um, the same story we have it in ISIS franchises in in Libya, for example, they are fighting alongside with men in, in many of the fronts. They are carrying guns, they are fighting, they, they blow up themselves as suicide bombers and also as normal, as normal uh, soldiers. At the same time, um, police forces, of course, is one thing that we are very much, um, we have heard a lot about it, especially about the case of ISIS when we have this Al Khansa uh, brigade, which is consisted of only women. Um, Interestingly, these women can drive around, they can actually carry guns, and they have their own headquarters, they have their own interrogation rooms, they have their own um, um, commanders. So everything is just for women, by women, and they are only in charge of women affairs as well. The same stories that we have, for example, with Jabhat Fatwa Sham in Idlib, um, they have started their own uh, women's security forces there. And security is the first step for all these groups to start with, because that is the main thing that you need in a weak or failed state, to provide security. So all these groups, just like ISIS, the first um, parallel institutions that they made was al Khansa, the, the police force, and then they developed the uh, institutions parallel institutions to other aspects of uh, the, the state apparatus. The same thing is the same pattern can be seen in other jihadi organizations, state building ones, including the uh, Jabhat Fatwa Sham and also um, Jaish al Fat. Uh, yeah. So they are following the same thing. So the, the, the women groups are out, the, the women police are out, and um, patrolling on, on patrolling the streets, mostly in terms of uh, dress code and codes of conduct, moral codes of conduct. Service provision, the same thing. For example, if you look at this here, um, this is an advertisement um, in ISIS territories asking for um, students, medical, people who are interested in joining medical schools. But the most important thing is that it says it's open to both men and, and females. So, so they are there, so they are bringing them in, they educate them, and then, then later on use them in that, seg um, in that gender segregated parallel institutions that they have. Uh, schools are still open, uh, still, uh, schools are still going on uh, in these, um, uh, under the territories, but the fact is that it is again gender segregated. So there would be women um, teachers, women educators, women principals, and the students would be only women as well. Uh, putting aside all those nasty things that they teach them, that's another story, but this is how it works. The system works in a way that education is still going on. They have also even uh, have um, English schools for the kids of the foreign jihadis. So they are actually being treated in different schools, or the English schools that they have it there. And there are advertisements of that everywhere, and uh, of course people talk about that, and they have seen those things. Um, same thing, doctors and nurses. We, the dress code of them is very important. They are not allowed to, to, uh, to uh, treat men at all. Kids uh, older than the age of uh, nine are not 
male uh, are not allowed to be visited by them. Um, even some of these the doctors are very much reluctant of uh, treating the um, male infants but because of, of, of those severe uh, consequences that it has. But still, they, they are giving um, in, in different hospitals, in Mosul, in Raqqa, in, in Dair Zur, they are giving uh, services to, to women. The same thing is in Idlib, where other jihadi organizations are in charge. The same thing is happening there, too. And also, I will get back to that just in a moment, sorry. And uh, tax collection, some women are allowed to have their own businesses in, in um, gender segregated places. I mean, the market is just for women. So they, are, uh, they have to pay tax, and that the tax is collected by women. Um, doctors, nurses, teachers, whoever else working there should pay tax as well, as well. And this is done by women. The women who are going to ask for task and tax, and also in the tax section of the cities like Raqqa or Mosul, we have a section of that which women are actually running. So women who want to pay tax, they have to go there and they pay the tax there. Um, the same thing goes for housing and sheltering. When people coming from other parts of the world, when the jihadi, foreign jihadis are coming, if, they are, if you are a single woman, you will be taken by these uh, housing and sheltering officers to um, uh, places, they call it Makar, which is a, a place that you know, you, it's like a base. So you, they keep you there until uh, you can find a job or you can find someone to marry or you can uh, actually get uh, to your own life within the caliphate. And uh, in these uh, makars, um, they are mostly assigning women who are coming from the same background or ethnicity or uh, nationality. For example, um, a British woman is uh, assigned to take care of the affairs of uh, single British women who are joining the caliphate. The same thing goes for other nationalities. We have Malaysians actually, actually there too, uh, and coming from all different countries, from the African countries to Asian and North American and European countries, we have them. So many of these women are incorporated as, as housing and sheltering. Um, officers there as well. And other roles like matchmaking, uh, that's a big thing that's happening there, uh, especially when it comes to single women or um, widows, because the life cycle of a jihadi ISIS, for example, or, or, or um, other two um, jihadi, um, the life cycle for a fighter in ISIS or in the other two state building jihadi organization is maximum one and a half year. It is in compare, for example, with a PKK uh, fighter that is about seven years. So the number of people who are, um, the number of women who are losing their husbands and um, becoming single, and therefore it would be a problematic thing in terms of that mahram and all this kind of stuff, uh, they're, they, they're constantly being re remarried to, to other, other men, other jihadi uh, fighters. And this is done through the uh, this matchmaking system, and this matchmaking system is not just a personal thing, it's, it's very much uh, administratively, uh, it has administration for that. You have a section, you have a, a diary, it's, it's like an organization, not an organization, it's a department there that is in charge of marriage and, and family issues, which women have a section in that, and those matchmakers are working under that section there. And of course, it comes at the end to the concept of legitimacy. For example, the hijra, you know, you, you are coming, you are burning your passports, uh, women are coming, women who are supposedly be the frontliners of uh, advocating the Western beliefs of emancipation. They are saying no to that and coming to a group, coming to a territory that supposedly be limiting them in many ways. Uh, but. Well, I'm in my, my research, I'm actually in depth talking about each of these uh, roles. I don't want to take your time much about that. And also the motherhood and family that I was talking about. Uh, the idea is to go beyond uh, being a passive mother or a passive member of the family just producing kids. So the, the, that's why, for example, ISIS encourages women to come, experts to come, ex women with expertise to come, doctors, um, um, educators, soldiers, um, engineers even to come. and. While working, they are emphasizing on, they emphasize the, the, the concept of motherhood as well. So they are not just uh, baby producers. And also advocacy and recruitment, that also plays an important role, especially online. Um, there are, um, there are, I mean, it is, in, I mean, it's a very simple thing if you have a Twitter account or, or Facebook, it's just enough for you to type something like, um, 
or to post something like, I, I am interested in jihadism, I'm interested in jihadism, or I, I would like to join ISIS, or something like that. And you will be surprised how fast some people would contact you. Many of them women would contact you and, and uh, well, you go through the process that, uh, I don't want to talk about it here now, but yeah, it's very, very fast you can uh, get in touch with these people. And they can provide everything for you, and everything is done by women. From the time that you meet online to the time that you get into your airplane to come to, to Turkey, um, somebody would be um, taking care of you in Turkey and then send you to the border cities and then you would be, uh, help me. They, they help you to pass the borders. So everything is just done by women here, majority of the work. Um, and um, that is all. And um, by that I, wouldn't, I want to thank you so much for, for your time and I would be more than happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you.